All right. Well, I think the end of the music means that we can begin. So uh, I had a fun time during my break reading some of your uh, comments, which I can't read the longer ones as they're happening. Um, but I uh, appreciate so much that you are engaging there. Um, I did see several concerns about those who are uh, who struggle with technology. And uh, I hope uh, we can get to well, I'm going to take just a moment. This is not what I plan, but I want to say a couple things about that. Um, in my both and webinar, which your conference has hosted in the past, we talked about, um, and actually I have another one called Telling the Old Story in New Time. We've talked about how to do worship in a way that even if you don't have internet in the building, uh, you can still do hybrid worship by pre recording or recording the worship that you do and then editing it after the fact and then uploading it after worship is over. So there are options for people uh, who don't have internet or who aren't tech savvy. Also, I just think it's so important that we keep in mind that our oldest population tends to be the one that struggles most with technology. They are the, the population that have had the most risk in this last year and a half of contracting and um, having the worst effects from COVID. And so we can't forget them in this season where we've taken worship out of the building. So I actually talk about four different types of worship that we might do, um, really worship slash ministry, because I think that uh, Bible study and discipleship groups and all those sorts of things uh, matter. But let me just real quick, um, the first way some of you probably have done this already uh, is drive-in worship. So you have people come to your parking lot, you use a bullhorn, you use a speaker system, or you get a an RF transmitter, and uh, you can have people broad or you know tune into a certain station. That allows you to do non. Um, it allows you to do physically distanced worship, but still have people together. Uh, there are some who still, you know, especially with this Delta variant, aren't ready to come right back to church yet. Um, the pastor I mentioned to you a moment ago uh, at the African American Church told me that they only have twenty percent of their congregation in person and 80% online. Uh, the really interesting thing is, uh, I thought this was just so, so fascinating. He said that their offering has gone up and their missional participation has gone up. They're supporting more things than they ever have before. And they've got more people coming to Bible study and classes online than came in the physical building, which I thought was interesting. This pastor said, I've decided, at least in my head, that I have an online worship with an in-person option versus in-person worship with an online option. He said, I'm, I've really shifted my thinking on that to do it in that way. So um, parking lot is one option. The second one, of course, is streaming. And there are three ways you can stream. Uh, you can stream um, where you pre-record and you put it online. Uh, and so you don't even have to have internet in your building. You record it you know, the day before, a couple of days, whenever it makes the most sense upload, and then you do live in the room. Uh, the second way is that you do it in real time. So you're streaming in the moment, um, but there are some considerations. Uh, I don't have time to get into all of that in this particular conversation. Um, and then the third option is what I call post both and worship. It's the idea that you're doing worship for both in the room and at home. And that's where you'd have cameras that record. My favorite church to talk about that is doing this is here in Ohio. Um, their name tells you everything you need to know about them and probably yourself if you're trying to do this. They're called Farmersville United Methodist Church. And that's a very descriptive name because they're out in the middle of nowhere. They don't have fast internet. They don't have a big budget. They don't have a lot of technology, but they record their worship at 9 a.m. Uh, goes from 9 to about 9.45, 9.50. At the end of that worship, they um, quickly take the sermon, a couple songs off of that. They put it into a video editor where they've already got a couple of announcements ready to go and a couple other things. And then they drive, I think they have to drive it into the city and upload it. And so you can either attend their 9 a.m. worship live in the room. It's not streamed. Or you can attend their 11 o'clock service, which they upload immediately after it's done. Uh, and you might think, well, that sounds like a, you know, fancy church. Well, uh, to be really honest with you, they don't, they, they're not real fancy. They just said, this is how we're going to do this because we can't do it live in the moment. Um, the third option I talk about is what I call telephonic worship. And that's the idea that you might uh, use a, a service like freeconferencecall.com or even Zoom has a call-in option 
where you can do a multiple hybrid kind of situation. So I can preach to the room, I can preach to the camera, and I can have a lapel mic clipped to my collar that is dialed up on a phone and people can call in and listen to the sermon. They won't be able to see it, but they can call in and listen if they're not technically savvy. Um, there's a church here in Ohio that I coach that uh, the pastor said, uh, she's got a very elderly congregation. She said, I, I needed to make it possible for them to experience the sermon. So she actually recorded her sermon to the answering machine. And uh, she did a 10 minute version of the sermon. They have four, four lines, I think at the church. And she said she reserved three of those four lines. Uh, you could be put on hold and listen to the sermon. So that was a way to make it possible for people who don't uh, know how to use technology. Um, one more thing with the telephone. My, my mom um, retired last year. She's 67. She was a nursing home nurse and COVID uh, was so stressful for her. She, got, she, she was going to go a little longer, but it was just too much. And so my wife said to her early in the pandemic, Karen, are you watching worship online? My mom said, I don't know how to do that. My mom has an iPhone. We bought it for her. Uh, she has the technology to do it. She just doesn't know how to use it. So my wife started texting her each week. Karen, here's the, my mom knows how to text. She just doesn't know how to use the browser on her phone very well. So my wife started texting her the link to the worship service every week. And so my mom would watch worship that way. Friends, one of the greatest opportunities in this season we're in is that we can help young tech-savvy people build relationships with those who are not as technically savvy and foster relationships that matter and, and really make those people feel very cared for in, in this time. I had a pastor in Florida tell me that um, he has a very elderly, he, he works in a retirement community. So he has a very elderly congregation that struggled to get online. So he said, what I did is I actually said one Sunday in worship, if you're tech savvy at all, if you know how to use any of this technology, would you please come to the church on Tuesday night? So he said, I got four people to show up. And what we did together was we figured out what the four or five steps are. We made up these cards. We uh, set up a, a list where people could have us come to their homes. And so we organized and went all throughout our congregation to people's homes, masked up, socially distanced. And um, he said, our congregation felt so cared for. It, it like revolutionized our church in some ways. And so they basically taught people how to do it and they built meaningful relationships in the process. The fourth type of worship that I talk about, uh, again, I think that it matters so much that we do worship in a way uh, that those who are not technically savvy can still be a part of it. Um, I call it analog worship. And that's the idea that you might burn an old, uh, find an old CD burner and burn an audio version of your message or, or find a, a DVD burner uh, and you'd have to find the software to do it. Uh, but, but actually make physical media or print out your sermon and drop it off at, at homes or put it in the mail. Um, but we cannot forget people in this season where we have to be socially distanced. Uh, so I just want you to keep in mind all of those options exist for our congregations, and uh, they 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 need you. They need you in this season. Um, so church has left the building, not just digitally, over the telephone, over uh, snail mail, and uh, and whatever else. So friends, I hope you'll consider those things. I was not going to go there, but I I saw your comments and thought that would be uh, helpful to talk about. So for about the last uh, year and a half, a little over now, I have been doing uh, training online for um, churches who are trying to figure out how to navigate this space. And so I did two different trainings, one called Telling the Old Story in a New Time, all about uh, worship that is not in the building. And then uh, for the last six months or so, I've been doing a training called Both And that is uh, really about how to do what I would call truly hybrid worship. Sorry, I don't know. I've got to eyelash driving me crazy there um so but true why i say truly hybrid worship because um some of us just stuck a camera in the back of the room and went about business as usual i think i said that a moment ago but we really have to reimagine what worship looks like so that it appeals uh, and, and transcends the technology um, here's the reality for people who are on line prior to the pandemic even people who are doing it really well it often looked like this. We would say to the room, we weren't looking at the camera, good morning and welcome to worship. We're so glad you're here. It's good to have you in worship with us today. And then we'd 
give a nod to the camera and we'd say, and if you're worshiping with us online, thanks for coming today. We're glad you're here too. And then we kind of go back to talking to the room and we'd never really talk to the camera again. Now, pre-pandemic, that was perfectly acceptable because we didn't have any other models. I liked being able to worship from vacation or wherever I was at. Uh, it was nice to be able to worship uh, digitally. And then when the pandemic hit, for those who were already online, they went from talking to the room to talking directly to the camera. And they started planning worship, knowing there were people on the other side of that camera uh, so that they would feel connected. And um, it was a wonderful thing. It's been a wonderful thing. Um, those of you who went online during the pandemic, you've spent almost the entire time you've been doing online ministry talking directly to the camera. So I think we face a really critical moment right now in the life of the church because so many of us have have really expanded our reach, uh, whether you are someone that teaches classes or works with children uh, or you're a lay speaker or, or whatever. I think it's important that we recognize if I did this training today like this and I talked to the room, you'd feel pretty disconnected. You know, I very intentionally look at the camera throughout a training like this. And when I do this training or um, my both and work, in a, in a room full of people, I have to split my attention from talking out here to talking directly to the camera. Here's the critical moment, friends. Uh, if we're not careful, we will turn the people into, in the room into the studio audience for the people at home if we only look at the camera. Because we've been doing that for so long, we might be tempted to do that. We don't want the people at home to feel like they're the studio or people in the room to feel like they're studio, the, the studio audience. And here's, I don't think that's as likely to happen. Here's the, the real danger in the next season of ministry that we're in. Um, if you're a leader in worship, um, if you're not careful, you will talk only to the people. And then what happens is you make the people at home feel like they're observers or spectators of something they're not really a part of. And so, like I said before, we don't rank our congregation by where they sit. It's not that the people in the room are more important than the people at home. It is that they're all important. So we've got to begin to shift the way that we do this uh, a, a bit. Uh, some of you may already uh, be there. As I said, I've been hearing the question a lot here lately. <clears throat> Can we stop doing this? I was um, consulting at a church a couple months ago in Wisconsin, and uh, I, I led a full-day training on both and for this church. And during one of the breaks, a very well-intentioned gentleman came to me and said, Jason, can we, can we stop doing this now? Like 90% of our people are back. And I said, no, you can't stop doing that. And I gave him some reasons. And I'm going to share those reasons with you in, in just a moment. Um, and he said, well, okay, if you say so, but it just seems to me like since most of our people are back, we shouldn't have to keep doing this. And I said, well, don't those 10% of the people that aren't here matter? Well, yeah. And then something very interesting happened. Sunday morning, I was secret worshiping, which basically means I'm just taking notes and I'm giving um, some feedback to the church and, and helping them with their strategies and so on. And throughout worship, I take notes in a notebook. And at the end of worship, a woman sitting next to me leaned over and she said, are you a blogger or something? And I said, well, no, uh, I said, I'm actually doing a consultation for your church on their online and in-person worship. She's like, oh, will you tell them they're doing a great job? She said, we uh, are brand new to this church. In fact, we found them on Good Friday because they were the only church we could find that had an online Good Friday service. And we loved it so much that we started worshiping online every week with them. And then um, when they started in person a couple of weeks ago, we came and we've been here every week since. You tell them we're so grateful that they did online because we never would have found them otherwise. And so I shared that the next day to that gentleman. And uh, he's like, okay, I'm convinced now. Um, friends, there are so many wonderful opportunities that we, now that we've taken church outside of the building. Now, most of us did not have a lot of time to strategize about this. Uh, I know some of you were online before. But some of you said you went online when this all began, and we rushed into really the how to do it um, and the what we needed to do. But we haven't spent probably enough time on the why. The why really does matter. It makes all the difference in the world. And I'm going to let 
uh, comedian Michael Jr. illustrate this for you, put a fine point on it, because the why will change everything about your strategy. Uh, check it out, and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. How do I know? A lot of people, when they think of the phrase, how do I know, they always want to put the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the question that you really should ask is, how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like, for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy. I can write books. I can be in a movie because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode. It's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at three o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is, is it's me. I travel around the country and I do stand-up comedy in case you didn't know. And in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So I'm, we're in Winston-Salem. I'm gonna show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right. So um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, "Amazing Grace." Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That bro could sing, you know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, what you give me the version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing. Here's what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. So friends, I, I can't say it better than that. Uh, I think what you just saw there is the difference that why makes. And so many of us had to jump into this church outside the building thing without time to really strategize about it. And it's never too late to figure out your why. So I want to encourage you to begin to think about that. We're going to spend the, the, the next half hour or so um, really talking about the why. Uh, what I want you to consider is that um, we have had centuries, centuries to develop our theology our methodology, our polity for our online expressions of, or our in-person expressions of worship. We know how to do that really well. We've only had about 18 months to figure out what online worship looks like, and not everything translates one-to-one. -one. Not everything we do in the room works at home in the same way. So 
today is really an invitation for you to think about what are the rites and rituals for the ministry that we do online? I don't think we've discovered quite yet what the rites and rituals are. And so I want to give you, uh, I'm going to give you 13 different reasons here uh, to, to continue this idea that we should do ministry outside of the building through online in a hybrid way. I think it, it should also come, um, you know, we need to keep doing what we're doing in the building. I do not think that online is a replacement for what happens in the building. But if we do both and, some really incredible things can happen. So let me talk you through uh, some of these things. Uh, 13 different reasons, and, uh, and then we're going to get into some uh, nitty-gritty specifics on a few of these. Uh, first thing is that um, one of the beauties of this last 18 months is that we have people that have left the church. Um, they left our church. They left the Big C Church. Maybe they didn't like a sermon you preached. Maybe they uh, liked the last pastor better. You know, whatever it is. I've been hearing pastors tell me that in the last uh, few months, they've been seeing people they haven't seen in a long time because, because they got re-engaged in, in worship in a much less vulnerable way by attending worship online. Um, I also want you to consider that there are three audiences that we need to give some attention to, um, and that is the committed. Those are the people that are already with us. We've got the disconnected. Those are the people I'm kind of talking about. And then there's a third group that we probably don't give enough attention to, and that is those who are seeking God in this crazy world that we're living in, where they're as, uh, we're about as divided as we've ever been as a nation, um, even in, in our church world, uh, with politics, with COVID. There's just so much that's happening right now, um, and, and people turn to God in moments like that. Um, I, I always think about 9-11. Uh, when 9-11 uh, hit, I was actually living in uh, Grand Prairie, Texas. I was not too far from where some of you are. Um, and uh, I remember the Sunday after those towers fell, driving to church, and we had to park in uh, the field next to the church because so many people are in church. If COVID hadn't kept us out of church and there was this pandemic, I think people would have responded by looking uh, to faith for answers. <laughs> so what does this have to do with anything? Well, what it has to do with the way that we conduct our ministry is that we've got to be careful about our language. We say things sometimes with an expectation that people just know what we mean when we say sacrament or Eucharist or, uh, you know, there's just lots of, there's lots of doxology. There's all these words, benediction, connect card. You know, all of these are words that we know, but outsiders do not know. So be careful about your language. The second group I want you to consider are those who have been shunned or have felt turned away by the church. They feel safe again because of what's happened with online worship. Um, I, I heard a story about a young man who went to church all the way up through confirmation and then um, some lifestyle uh, issues uh, in his life uh, meant that the church, uh, he was no longer welcomed there. Um, hadn't gone to church in 10 or 15 years. And then when the pandemic hit, he started worshiping online again because no one was there to judge him. And he started worshiping at the church that he grew up in and uh, got really kind of hooked back in. And then when he went home to see his mother for Easter this year, actually went to church with her for the very first time uh, in, in 10 or 15 years. Um, people who have felt shunned because their hair was too long or they had tattoos or whatever the issue might be, have the opportunity now to worship with us um, in a way that's less vulnerable. I want you to also consider that this is the best worship our shut-ins have ever experienced since they became shut-ins. Um, it's, it's not just a, um, a CD in the mail or, or whatever. They have actually been able to participate in the chat. They've been able to uh, really engage with us in worship. I know some churches that have actually set up relationships with nursing homes. I know some churches, this isn't the same kind of shut-in, but that are streaming in prisons. Um, there's just this wonderful opportunity now to share uh, worship, share the gospel, not just worship. I know some of you are probably not involved in worship, but Bible study, asynchronous learning, where we can uh, gather together in meaningful ways online. So, um, these are a couple of the, the reasons behind the why this worship outside the building needs to continue. Uh, here's, here's one 
that I think um, we have a growing number of people who are vacationers, uh, who are business travelers, who have busy family lives. Do you remember, I'm just going to make sure you're all still with me. I haven't seen anything in the chat for a moment, but do you remember when Sunday used to be a sacred day? Anybody remember that? Like they didn't schedule soccer games and gymnastics tournaments and football and the blue laws. Thank you, Holly, for for saying that you all remember that right sunday is no longer a sacred day anymore in our in our culture uh you know things get scheduled and the beauty of this season that we're in is that we have the opportunity now to let people attend worship even when they're on vacation even when they're at the soccer game and uh all of those other things um i i really love this one and 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 this one is almost uh, mind-blowing at this point for me, and that is that those who didn't make it on Sunday get to worship with us. Think about this. It's almost crazy to think that we used to put all of this effort and attention uh, in Sunday morning, and when Sunday morning was over, the only people that got to benefit from Sunday morning were the people that came on Sunday morning. So you might have 50 people that show up, and that's really the extent of who gets to benefit. Now that we're recording our worship and archiving it, we have this wonderful opportunity for it to live on beyond the moment. Let me ask in the chat, how many of you have noticed that your on-demand or on-delay numbers have risen and maybe your, in, your live numbers have dropped a little bit? How many of you are noticed that, noticing that people are starting to watch Sunday afternoon or Monday or Tuesday or, or whatever? Um, I'm seeing some of you are saying that. Yes. Uh, think about it. We live in the Disney Plus, Netflix, Amazon Prime video culture where people want to watch when it's convenient for them. And I know this one's hard for us to hear, but we also have people who um, want to fast forward past the parts they don't really like. So they watch on delay, you know, with, with TiVo and, and uh, DVR, uh, we discovered that years ago. Like in my household, there was a practice often where we'd wait 15 minutes to start watching the show so we could fast forward past the commercials. What does that mean for how we plan worship and, and make uh, the experience really connect all throughout? I think we've got to start thinking about that. Uh, but friends, I want to give you one thing to consider, and that is our worship now, because it lives on, we've got to be careful even about our language with worship. Um, you might say as a standard thing, good morning, welcome to worship. I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday. Now, what happens if I decide I'm going to watch your worship on Wednesday afternoon during my lunch break? Uh, I know it's not live, but there is a little bit of a disconnect. You could very easily adjust your language to say, welcome to worship. We're so glad you're here. Hope you're having a great day. And without using that temporal language, it becomes a little bit more uh, engaging. Um, here's the other thing I want you to consider. Uh, don't name your church's service you know, January 23rd, 2021, First United Methodist Church. Don't call the title of your YouTube video the date and the name of your church. Why not, Jason? Because no one's searching for that. They're searching for sermon topics and titles and things like that. Be creative with your titles. Um, and the last thing I'll say is just give uh, some context uh, for posterity's sake. Capture what's happening on the day that you're doing it. Um, back in... Um, in February, I did my both and training for uh, the Central Texas Conference, which I know we have some folks on today. Hello, Central Texas, glad you're here. Um, and uh, the day that I did it was the day that that horrible ice storm happened and there was a huge accident uh, on, on the road. But a church was telling me in a follow-up conversation that they realized this evergreen stuff. They said, we didn't quite get it when you said it, but now we understand. That day, their pipes burst and flooded their building. And of course, in Texas, you know, you get some ice. And I know when I lived there, there were some icy days. Um, you know, it's not common that you get that kind of frigid temperatures where it would freeze your pipes and, and break them. Um, they said, we just kept referring to the flood, the flood, the flood, all throughout our worship. And we realized that somebody watched it six months later was not going to have any idea. They were probably thinking we were preaching about Noah or something uh, because we didn't really give context. The people in the room don't need to know there's a flood. They, they knew it because they walked, they drove through that weather to get there. They walked past the slippery when wet signs. So all I'm saying, friends, is just to say, hey, today we've had some unusual weather here in uh, Texas that we don't often have. Our pipes uh, burst 
we've got a flooded building. So uh, you may hear us refer to that today. That captures for posterity's sake what happened in that moment and people will um, be able to connect with you later. So be evergreen. Um, here's one that I really love a lot um, that apparently I didn't insert my graphic for, or maybe it's here. No, that's not the one. All right, sorry. I, I'm, I'm gonna say this one. Apparently I didn't uh, insert my graphic. Uh, but that is that uh, visitors now can check us out without really any uh, vulnerability involved. Um, I have been saying more recently that uh, worship online is like the taster spoon for worship in person. And what I mean by that is that you don't have to buy the whole ice cream cone. You can try, uh, you know, two or three flavors before you decide which one you want to go to. I don't know about you and your church, but I've been having more and more pastors tell me they have visitors coming who have been worshiping online uh, throughout uh, worship uh, throughout this last few few weeks. Uh, one pastor said, I had a really funny moment where I walked up to a couple and I said, good morning, welcome to worship. I'm Matt, I'm Pastor Adam. And they looked at him like, uh-huh, yeah, we know. And he said, I, I recognize, we all realized at that moment that they had been watching me preach from home for weeks is just the first time we ever met in person. Uh, so uh, that's another reason that this um, worship should continue. Geography doesn't matter anymore. Uh, I've had so many churches tell me they have people worshiping from all sorts of different states. Uh, people have moved away. I've had people tell me that they didn't lose their snowbirds this year, that their snowbirds left and went to warmer weather, but still continued uh, to be uh, in worship. And then um, I had somebody tell me in, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina the other day that they had somebody from Florida take their vacation, drove up to Charlotte so they could join the church, but they're driving back to Florida where they live and they're going to participate from uh, where they live. So geography is another reason that we should keep doing this and why, why we need to keep doing it. Uh, this one affects uh, my family. I have a special needs child. And uh, I'll tell you that when my son was younger, going to church was sometimes stressful. It sure is nice to have a respite, the ability to worship from home on those days where it's really, really hard. Um, as a special needs parent, sometimes you feel like uh, everybody's looking at you in worship and that can be very uncomfortable. My favorite thing of all about this particular worship is now we can dialogue with people and they can help us shape uh, the, the services that we're doing if we do it in real time. Uh, so I mentioned my friend George Ashford in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. They actually have a, um, uh, a section at the front of their church they call the Amen section. They have three high top tables and computers there and um, people chat all throughout worship. And so the amen section will actually yell out some of those amens. So, you know, somebody at that section might uh, for on Forrest's behalf in the room say, we have folks from Germany and Mexico. And the African-American tradition, there's this uh, feeling of call and response uh, that's, a, that's a part of that narrative. And so they still can do that, even though people are at home, they have people dedicated to that back and forth, which I think is pretty cool. Um, those who have uh, social anxiety, my wife is an introvert. She said to me at the beginning of this pandemic, I've been preparing my whole life for this. Um, she was ready uh, for it. In fact, my wife is such an introvert. If we had one of these at my church, she'd sit here every week. Um, not that she's unfriendly, but she is just an introvert. Uh, so uh, think about the fact that uh, for folks that, that uh, suffer from those things, uh, I'm sorry, my jokes have not gotten any better and uh, you are, you're not even groaning at them. So that's, that's a bad sign. Um, I just had someone uh, share this one with me two days ago, and that is that uh, those in their church who um, have hearing and uh, vision difficulties have really appreciated the online worship. They said, sometimes I come to worship and I sit and I can't hear anything or I can't see anything. So I'm able to go home and watch the service again and hear it and turn it up really loud or worship from home and be able to uh, fully listen as well. Uh, and then the last one that I want to share with you here is that it ain't over till it's over. And friends, um, I just want to say that um, this pandemic, we're all seeing it. Uh, the Delta variant is, is serious. I've had five in-person events cancel. Uh, I'm going to do them online now, uh, but it's not over. 
I just saw this a couple of days ago that uh, the, the virus is, uh, is upticking everywhere. And what we don't want to do is lose all of the skills that we've developed and put our cameras away and stop doing it. Uh, you know, and then we have to do things like this again. Although I don't know anybody that really did that, but someone sent me that picture and I thought that was pretty, pretty funny. Um, I guess that's a socially distanced choir. So y'all really are a tough crowd today. N none of my typical jokes are, are hitting today. It's, that's tough. Yeah, they, they probably are hot. Uh, they just lather up and shower right there in the church too, I think. Um, uh, moving on, friends. Uh, I, one of the questions, um, did I skip number 11? No, that's introverts. Uh, did I skip one? Let's see. Dialogue. Did I talk about dialogue? Special needs families. I think. Oh, evangelism. Yes. Thank you. How did, how did you know I skipped that? Um, I can't see you smiling. That's true. I'm dealing with what you all deal with. You know, you, you like being able to see your, um, your church. So yes, I missed evangelism. It's never been so easy to uh, share our church with others. Hold on. Let me see if I can get that slide up. Uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, evangelism has never been so easy. I know people who um, will, would never feel comfortable asking a coworker to come to church or a friend or whatever, but they can post a link on their website or on their YouTube not YouTube, on their Facebook page or on Twitter and invite people to church. So it's a really wonderful way to engage uh, people who are not part of it. Now, one of the questions I keep getting, what if they don't come to the building though, Jason? Uh, what if they don't come to the building? Well, I mean, I think it would be great if they all came to the building, but I still think that a an experience of worship that is transcendent, that makes a big difference in the life of someone who is attending matters. Uh, I put it this way. Um, I am a fan of the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe over there on the right. I've seen every movie. I bought Disney Plus so I can watch every series. Uh, I have a few t-shirts. I've invested some money in Marvel, but you know what? I haven't bought a comic book, a Marvel comic book since I was in high school. Now, does that mean it doesn't count that I'm not really a Marvel fan or that I haven't really experienced those stories? No, I think it still matters. It's, it's a little different than the stories that are in the book. Uh, but friends, uh, if we are creating transcendent experiences of worship and other ministry, not just worship, children's ministry, Bible study, uh, UMW, you know, men's ministry, if we can uh, create both and opportunities people are still experiencing the gospel in important ways. Um, now, uh, I think it's really important that we make some intentional decisions about who we're trying to reach. Uh, if you don't make an intentional decision, you will default to just talking to the people in the room. Uh, a few weeks ago when I was in, uh, in South Carolina, North Carolina, um, I conducted a poll during a training all for churches who are doing hybrid ministry. Uh, they brought me out. Um, I'm on retainer with their conference. I'm doing a bunch of coaching. These people got equipment. So they were all already bought in. And so I conducted this poll and I'm going to, I want to show you the results and I want you to be mindful of where you would be on this particular poll. I'm going to read it to you so that uh, it's, it's probably a little small. Uh, it, the option A said, our priority is on the people in the room we stream, but our focus is really on creating an experience for the people in the room. Over half the people said that's what they're doing. So basically, they're creating worship for people in the room and people at home can watch if they want to. The second group, which I hope more people would be here, we intentionally create an experience for people both in the room and online. We've adapted our practices in worship so that people at home and in person feel like an equal priority. Less than half of the people are, are, that's their priority right now. Um, the, the next one is basically that we are creating worship for people online. We don't really care about people in the room. I didn't expect anyone to say that. And the last one there is just about people who are doing online only. Uh, friends, if you don't make an intentional decision about who you're trying to reach, you will default to the room and you'll make observers of people at home. And I don't think we want to do that. 
Um, there are two words that I think we need to eliminate from our vocabulary when we think about worship. The first word is watching. We don't want watchers of worship at home. We want worshipers from home. Second word is viewers. We do not want viewers of worship at home. We want participants in worship at home. So friends, the only way we can kind of go from viewers to participants and watchers to worshipers is to reimagine how we do worship. So I want to give you a little tip, something to think about at your church, um, and that is uh, creating what I call a both and think tank. A both and think tank is a group of people that will come together and uh, really start to brainstorm about how you're going to make an experience that is for people both in the room and uh, online. And so I, these are just a few things to keep in mind as you're, um, as you're thinking about this. I'm sorry, we don't have a handbook, but if you want to, this will be recorded. And uh, you can also take a screen capture, uh, take a photo with your phone if you want. Uh, let's just talk about a couple of these things. Number one, I think it's important that we start with the why. Uh, we already talked about the importance of the why. You, you do better work when you know why. The second thing is that we have to build meaningful relationships uh, within that think tank. I'm not talking about the people at home. We need to do that too, but um, do some work together on the team. The third thing is to have fun together as you're brainstorming about what the next iteration of worship looks like. Uh, in my other training that I do, um, I talk about, um, I show some clips from the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, and we see how he has iterated all throughout worship, um, or not worship, the pandemic. And, uh, and I think we have to do the same. And so um, how can we have fun and do that? Uh, the next thing is to have a process. Uh, sometimes you get a bunch of people to brainstorm together, and you don't ever actually get any traction with it. Uh, I think it's important that people covenant together in this work. Uh, so that you don't have a naysayer that doesn't like where you're trying to take your new expression of worship uh, and go around and tell everybody in the church, well, I didn't like that idea. We had a better idea. You have to covenant to say whatever we walk out of this um, conversation, this think tank conversation with, uh, we all have to um, support it and, and be on board with it. Um, mutual respect is so important. I, I sometimes see egos pop up at church and we don't listen to each other as much as we wait for our turn to talk. And I've even seen creative bullies who won't let things go. And so whoever you're going to have on your think tank, they've got to be able to commit to having mutual respect. Um, uh, keep the ideas flowing. Uh, no idea is a bad idea. So as you're brainstorming, think about lots of different opportunities for how you create an experience that's for people at home and in the room. Uh, and then determine a goal so that you actually have measurables. What is, what are we actually going to, when do we want to implement this new idea? When are we going to live into it? Um, I want to share a couple of uh, other priorities. I know, uh, I think we've got about seven or so minutes left before um, we're officially uh, into Q&A time. So I want to honor that. Uh, but let me give you what I consider the top five priorities to doing worship outside the building where um, online is concerned. Uh, the first thing is to create an intimate experience of worship. Um, all the technology, all the production value in the world cannot overcome a situation where I'm talking to the room and making you feel like you're just watching what they're doing. So intentionally talking to the camera um, getting the camera close enough. Friends, if you cannot make out facial features, the camera is too far away. The majority of your shots need to be head to toe. Um, if they're not head to toe, weird things like this can happen. I'm just going to let you stare at that for a second. That's a really strange optical illusion, isn't it? Uh, first, I thought the guy was sitting down with his shorts on, but that's the person right behind him. Uh, that was supposed to be funny, but nobody is laughing, so I'm sorry. Uh, but that, that is a real not doctored photo. I thought that was pretty fun. Um, you obviously did not. But here's, here's a $8.99 investment I would encourage you all to make. Uh, and that is to go out and buy one of those little dry erase boards that you write your grocery list on and a big, thick dry erase marker. And what I want you to do is to uh, consider, uh, if you're a lay speaker, when you're preaching, um, if you're a musician, 
if you're a children's ministry worker, whatever your role is in your church, write the number down of the people that are worshiping live in the moment or um, write down the number of the people that are watching that week and put that whiteboard somewhere near the camera so that when you look out, you recognize that that camera is not a camera. It's 34 people sitting there. Um, in the same way that you'd look at the people in the balcony and over here and in the back, uh, those people at home matter as well. Um, uh, let me uh, also say that um, you should uh, create, well, hold on, let me, let me get to my slide here. Um, I think every church who's doing hybrid worship needs an online advocate. Uh, you need to assign one, somebody who is actually watching the worship that you do, uh, not in the room. Uh, instead, uh, have them on Sunday morning be somewhere else in the building and watch worship. That's going to help you uh, figure out um, if the sound isn't very good, if person's never looking at the camera, if there's no interaction. Somebody has to come and say, hey, we're leaving people out at home. Somebody's got to care most about that. I think that's an excellent job for laity. Um, and so, uh, oh, th thank you. <laughs> I'm reading your comments now. Thank you. I, I wasn't sure what Hiller was. So I was, I was getting ner nervous there for just a second. Um, so make sure you have somebody that's got their eyes on it uh, for the outsider. Uh, the next one then, friends, is to continue to iterate. Keep trying new things. Don't get settled. Um, uh, Matt said this in his opening devotion. And I, I actually pulled this quote in after I heard him say it. Uh, Carrie Newhoff, who's a great author and blogger and leader, had this to say about innovation in the church. He said, too many leaders will step backwards. Basically, they'll step back into the past the moment they step into their buildings. And I think that is really true uh, for us as well. So we've got to be careful uh, with how we um, are, are doing things um, for that online crowd. Uh, how quickly we have forgotten. Uh, you know, the thing about it is that uh, it was not that long ago that the only way we could experience worship was through that camera. And now we've kind of gotten back into the room and we want to let go of that um, or, or get it out of the way or, or not have it present. Um, engage people online. Now, I saw one of the comments in the chat earlier about how do you get people to engage in the moment? Um, let me give you a couple tips here. And uh, we may we may just slide our break by five minutes and then uh, and then do our Q and A. Um, a couple of things to consider: uh, chat strategy. Your chat is like your digital narthex or your welcome center or wherever you connect with people. So I want to encourage you to do a couple of different things um, because um, yeah, rethink church. I remember rethink church. A couple of things. Uh, number one, welcome people. As they come into the chat, each time a person comes in, say by name, hey, uh, Don, it's good to see you. Cynthia, great to have you with us. Lonnie, awesome that you're here today. David, I'm so glad you're in worship. Uh, make them feel uh, acknowledged. The second thing uh, to consider is I'm leaving this up longer than I typically would, but I want you to be able to write it down. Um, take questions. Some people don't know what some of the words we use mean. They don't understand what joys and concerns are. Uh, we all know what that means, but an outsider might not know. Um, I actually know one church that is actually uh, posting each movement of worship. They post a little paragraph about what's happening in that moment on purpose uh, for the outsider, so they understand uh, what's happening. Um, I'm, I, hopefully that was up long enough. Uh, what were the other ones? Um, uh, reinforce everything you're saying. So I like to encourage churches to prepare a document. So every time a sermon point is shared, put it in the chat. When you share the offering, put it in the chat. Someone's birthday today, put it in the chat. Uh, if the pastor has a really excellent quote, put it in the chat. Uh, just use that in the same way those of you who have screens in your worship, you use it to reinforce the message. Use the chat to reinforce. Also, keep in mind that some people watch on a smart TV at home so you might still encourage them to engage in the chat. There's a little, this is really technical for some of you, but there's a little thing called a QR code. You can put on the screen, they can raise their device, put the camera app and it will open the chat so they can uh, participate. Uh, post all the links. If you're, if you're doing announcements, if you're trying to get them to sign up for things, if you want them to participate in your church, put those links in the chat. Uh, foster relationships. 
Uh, so uh, it asked people if they have prayer. Uh, one of my favorite stories was from a, a worship pastor online. Um, a friend of mine, they record their worship ahead of time, so they pre-record, but he always monitors the chat live as it's uh, being premiered for the first time. He said, Does any, uh, how's everybody doing today? Someone in the chat said, not very good. It's been a, a bad uh, week. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, can I pray for you today? And he said, uh, sure. And he said, well, if you'd like to pray, I'm going to put my uh, Zoom link in the chat. And after worship, I'll hang, keep it open for 10 minutes. You're welcome to pray if you'd like to. So 10 minutes after worship, or worship ends, he's got it open for 10 minutes. He pops in, says, Andy, thank you so much for praying with me today. And he told him whatever was happening in his life. And um, Andy said, I'm so sorry to hear that. Let me pray for you. So he prays for this gentleman. And at the end, he says, I don't know that I recognize you. Have we met before? And he said, no, I've never actually been to your physical church. I've only ever attended online. And I consider you to be my online pastor. Thank you so much for praying with me. You'll see, you'll see more of me. Uh, that's a relationship that built all digitally. And, um, and I believe that that person is still involved at the church. So um, invite follow-up, uh, digital connect card, a way for new people and, and regular people to be able to register their attendance. Um, we don't want our online worship to be a big revolving door for people uh, on the outside. Um, let, me, uh, let me move on to the next one here. I, I do want to honor our break time. So we're, there, was, there are five of them and we're getting to number five now. And that is to keep casting vision. Uh, people are tired of the pandemic. They are tired of masks. They're tired of hearing about uh, vaccines. They are tired of social distancing. Uh, we've got to keep casting vision. We've got to keep people aware of all those 12, 13 groups that I shared with you. Uh, friends, again, as lay people, we are like the cheerleaders. We are the, the support. We are the priesthood of all believers. Uh, so it's not all on your pastor's shoulders to, to bear that burden. We're a part of it. So we're part of that movement. We are dominoes in the rally that I think can make a difference. Um, I'm going to just share two final things with you here uh, before we uh, do Q&A over the break. Uh, and that is that there are uh, four audiences that we need to keep uh, thinking about as we do worship. Uh, audience number one is the people that are in our physical space, and they're the ones that we think about the most. The second audience I want you to consider is that some of our people are worshiping at home. We know they're at, we know them, they're at home, they're not with us, uh, so we've got to keep them in mind. I'm going to talk about how we keep them in mind in just a moment. Um, we've got visitors or guests who are worshiping with us online for the first time or who are in the room for the first time. Uh, and then lastly, we've got a growing number of people who now watch on delay. So that's great. Oh, sorry, that's not the right camera there. Uh, so what does that uh, have to do with anything, Jason? How is that helpful? I want you to consider that sometimes we only think about the people in the room at the moment. We're not thinking about the rest. Um, if you're doing interactive things, Palm Sunday, you hand out branches to people when they come in the building on Palm Sunday in the room. You know some people are at home, so send ahead a kit to them that has a palm branch in it uh, during Lent or during Advent. If, if we find ourselves in limited in-person again for Advent, you might create an Advent wreath uh, with candles. Or, uh, you know, it could be very simple. I heard about churches doing this last year. Um, you know some of those people. Then the third group is the people that we don't know, the newbies who are worshiping with us online or in the room. In the room, it's easier. You you give them the same thing, uh, the palm branch or whatever. But at home, uh, if it's Palm Sunday, you could put a PDF file of a palm branch in the chat that they can download um, and a PDF file that they can cut out and participate fully at home. It's, you're going to have a craft project today in addition to. And then uh, the last group, those who watch on delay, you can put that same file on the archive of your worship so they can download it and participate as well. The final thing I'm going to give you here in the last minute I have before um, our, our break is um, I created this tool that I call the both and audit. And uh, again, I realize we are uh, largely 
laity uh, here today. I think there are a few clergy on, but um, friends, again, I just think you are so important in helping us, uh, helping the church um, be effective in, in this season. So here's the both end audit. I first um, I mentioned assigning advocates. I think somebody's got to advocate for the people at home and in the room. And seven questions you might ask as you're planning worship. What is the purpose of whatever aspect of worship you're planning, and does it translate to both audiences? And it doesn't matter if, I'm going to leave this up for a second, it doesn't matter if you are um, doing traditional worship or non-traditional worship or Tze or camp classics, this applies to any kind of worship. Second question is, does this moment belong in both experiences? Not everything does belong in online that does in the room and vice versa. Is there a participatory or interactive way of doing what we're talking about? I'm going to say it again. We will always have watchers. We will always have viewers if we don't do interactivity and participation. Um, the next is, is this too short or too long for either audience? We don't have as long attention spans at home as we do in the room. So uh, we want to be careful about uh, the length of what we're doing online. Uh, how does this translate at home and doing an alternate moment? I didn't get to talk to you about alternate moments. If there's time at the end, I will. Um, does this need any additional contextualization for either audience? And so um, remember in the room, there's field of view of everything that's happening online. It's only what the camera sees. So you may need to give more context. And then finally, how will a first time viewer or in-person guest receive what we're talking about? All right, friends, I'm sure you feel like you've been drinking from the fire hose. I know I've given you a lot. Uh, thank you for letting me adjust a little on the schedule. Um, we're going to take, a, a you want to do 10 minutes, Susan?